Welcome to the Solar Clips video series covering the basics of solar photovoltaics or solar PV. My name is Drew Chivon and I serve as an extension specialist with the University of Maryland. In previous videos we considered system and wire sizing among other topics and you can review those uh, videos for more information but in today's video we're going to consider some of the fundamental aspects and the rationale for grounding a photovoltaic system. While we can't address every aspect of grounding in this particular video, a general understanding of electrical grounding as we'll cover in this video can help you to begin to design a safe and effective photovoltaic system. While electrical grounding is a complicated and often misunderstood uh, concept, it does serve as a critical safety measure in all electrical systems and installations, protecting against electrical shock and ensuring correct system operation. Now when we use the term ground or grounding, we're usually referring to an intentional connection or bond to the earth. While this connection to the earth is often accomplished by driving a copper-coated rod into the ground, we'll discuss the practical implementation and installation of a grounding system in other upcoming videos. But in considering some of the reasons why we ground electrical systems, in this video we'll first recognize that grounding provides an electrical reference point, or a reference voltage, called zero potential or ground potential, against which all other voltages within the system can be established and measured. You see, voltage is always relative to some other point of reference within the circuit. In this simple circuit, for example, we have four common ground points that may or may not actually be connected to earth ground, or to a vehicle chassis if it was a mobile system. But the common ground points in either case, be it the earth ground or a vehicle chassis, will allow electrical current to flow back to its power source, whether it be the utility transformer, a vehicle battery, or something else. And while these ground points would ideally be wired with the return paths connected back to the power supply at a single point, that's not always practical. And so in many applications, a grounding system will provide a circuit return path, as we'll discuss momentarily, with many circuit diagrams like this one simply using the ground symbol to identify a common return path. Now, as we've seen in previous videos, voltage is like an electrical pressure or a potential difference between two points. We may assume that point A is at some particular voltage level, but the absolute voltage at point A will truly be unknown without some point of reference, which can be provided by the grounding system and is usually considered to be at zero potential. You see, in theory, the earth, which forms the ultimate ground, can absorb or dissipate an unlimited amount of electrical charge. So under the assumption that the earth ground is the absolute zero or at a zero potential, we can measure between the live connection at point A to the absolute zero of the earth. We might measure the absolute voltage at point A relative to any of the common ground points as let's say 12 volts in this example. In any sense, that's why the term ground is used to denote a common electrical point of zero potential. So this is how a grounding system with a direct and physical connection to the earth can serve as a zero volt reference point within an electrical circuit. In a phase to neutral configuration, for instance, the neutral is intended to provide a zero volt reference for the supply voltage to correct, while a perfect grounding electrode system would have zero ohms of resistance to the earth, the neutral voltage would be above zero for an actual grounding electrode system. In that case, the voltage difference between the neutral and phase could be lower than the equipment's optimum operating voltage. Now if you recall, any electrical circuit must be complete for electricity to flow through it even a compromised electrical circuit. With that said, a properly grounded system can provide a complete return path for the electricity to flow, reducing the risk of electrical shock from any fault current, preventing equipment damage from electromagnetic interference and electrostatic buildup, and or safely dissipating lightning induced surges or other external high voltage. Let's consider a simple case with some hot wires carrying current from a power supply to an electrical load and a neutral wire carrying the current from the electrical load back to the power supply. In this example, the light fixture is provided with a live black and a neutral white conductor. The live or black conductor passes through the main service panel, through the light switch, and through the electrical load, in this case a light bulb, before returning on the neutral or white line through the main service panel and back to the source. And under normal circumstances, the metal casing of the light fixture would not conduct any of that electricity as it's simply part of the physical structure. But if there was a loose electrical conductor or some damage to its protective insulation, for instance, then the live power could contact and energize the metal casing around the light fixture or any other metal enclosure, conduit, or structure. 
then there would be a significant risk for electric shock to anyone that might come in contact with the metal casing around the light fixture. An energized enclosure could also pose a fire hazard as nearby combustible materials could be ignited by any arcing or by the heating of the bare metal by a fault current flow. Now, a properly installed grounding system will allow that electricity to flow through the ground wire when a short circuit occurs. And while this ground wire runs from the main service panel to a ground rod buried outside, the ground rod isn't really used for ground faults as the electricity will try to return to its source rather than just going into the earth. Even with a ground rod connected to the neutral to transformer providing a potential return path for that electricity, the path through the ground will have a very high resistance or a high impedance. And since electricity follows the path of least resistance, it would look for an easier path to follow. With that said, the purpose of the ground rod is to dissipate static electricity in external high voltages like lightning strikes, as we'll discuss a little later in this video. So also, if you were to come into contact with a hot wire or other energized component, then your body could complete the circuit. In this case, the current could pass through your body, through the ground, and into the service panel before returning to the power supply. But once again, the resistance or impedance would be very high, while the corresponding electrical current would likely not be high enough to flip the breaker and cut the power, resulting in a potentially fatal situation. So the earth is not considered to be an effective fault current path, as is indicated in Article 250.4A5 of the National Electrical Code. With the fault current returning to its power source, even passing through your body and the soil, creating a voltage gradient within the soil itself. Hence, earth grounding will not remove any dangerous touch voltage and it will not provide the path needed to clear ground fault since the earth will likely not carry a sufficient electrical current to open an overcurrent device. So in order to clear a ground fault, you need to have an effective ground fault current path with low impedance from the point of the fault all the way back to the source. A ground wire will provide this low impedance or effective ground fault path, allowing the electrical current to more directly flow from the location of the fault back to its power source. A ground fault, which is the undesirable flow of current through the grounding conductor, will take this easier route through the service panel to facilitate the operation of an overcurrent protection device. In the case of a fault, the current will flow through this ground wire into the service panel through the bus bar and return to the power source via the neutral wire. So this neutral to ground bond in the service panel will complete the circuit providing a path for the current to return to its source. Just note that this neutral to ground bond is made within the main service panel but not in any sub panels. And with the ground wire having a very low resistance, the substantial and instantaneous increase in the electrical current flowing through the ground wire will trip an overcurrent protection device, typically a fuse or a breaker. This automatic opening or disruption of the circuit will cut off the fault current and disable the power from running to the light fixture. So the circuit will be turned off whenever the circuit protection device is opened, preventing electrical shock from any equipment enclosures or any other metal parts that may be energized until the system can be inspected and repaired. And this is why the ground wire is connected to any metal components that could potentially allow electricity to leave its circuit, with the neutral to ground bond helping to clear the fault. So that's a basic example of how a grounding system provides a low impedance and safe return path for the current, preventing dangerous electrical shocks. And this is why equipment grounding is so critical with all the conductive materials terminating at a single point, typically near the service panel. This is also why the ground wire, for instance, is connected to the ground terminal of each receptacle in your house. All components of a solar photovoltaic system should likewise be grounded, including the solar array, mounting structure, inverter, charge controller, and other equipment, although we'll address the practical installation of these grounding systems in another video. But in today's video, we'll continue to see how ground fault protection in a photovoltaic array will detect the ground fault in the PV output circuit, interrupt the flow of the fault current, and provide an indication of the ground fault. Ground fault protection is often built into an inverter with a serviceable fuse providing array ground fault protection within its DC input circuit. In this case, the ground fault will flow through the grounding electrode conductor bonding connection, usually in the inverter, with the grounding connection passing through the ground fault protection device. If the fuse is opened, the inverter will immediately shut down and disconnect the ungrounded conductor. A pair of circuit breakers, on the other hand, could also provide array ground fault protection for some low voltage PV systems whose inverters may not already provide that protection. A lower rated ground fault circuit breaker is tripped when the current between the grounded and grounding conductors exceeds its rating, forcing the mechanically linked circuit breaker to open the ungrounded conductor. So faulted circuits will be isolated by automatically disconnecting the ungrounded conductors or by causing the inverter or charge controller to automatically stop the supply of power to the output circuits. 
But in any case, the disruption of the grounding connection caused by a trip fuse or a circuit breaker will effectively interrupt the ground fault as soon as the ground fault exceeds the rating of the overcurrent protection device. Now that we've outlined the rationale for ground fault protection, we'll address the safe dissipation of static electricity and external high voltages. You see, proper grounding and bonding will limit unintended voltage on an electrical system that could arise from lightning strikes, line surges, or any unintentional contact with a higher voltage line. While any photovoltaic system will likely require some form of lightning protection, particularly those areas experiencing high flash density, it's important to note that system grounding or a ground rod installed at the array won't really protect a system from a direct lightning strike, as a direct lightning strike would likely inflict substantial damage to whatever it actually hits. Any damaged equipment would simply need to be repaired or replaced at that point. With that said, properly designed lightning protection systems can safely conduct either direct or indirect lightning surges away from the system and the equipment. Lightning protection requirements are only briefly mentioned in the National Electrical Code, but are addressed more extensively in the National Fire Protection Association's NFPA 780, the standard for the installation of lightning protection systems. Adequate lightning protection for a photovoltaic array will capture the energy from a lightning strike through a low impedance network of air terminals or lightning rods, and then transfer that energy into a grounding electrode system. In this case, any surges induced by a direct or indirect lightning strike would be conducted to the ground, safely away from the building and or equipment. While a lightning grounding electrode system is bonded to the grounding electrode system for the electrical service, it would typically not be bonded to the grounded conductor of the DC system as that would introduce more than one ground connection for the DC system. Now, indirect lightning strikes can also cause dangerous and damaging voltage transients, with failure to ground an electrical system likely resulting in damage to the system components and equipment. You see, lightning always tries to return to its source, which is essentially the earth. So when a pulse of lightning encounters an ungrounded electrical system, that electrical current will travel through the system, damaging any equipment or starting a fire, as it seeks a path back to the earth. And it will do so by passing through any electrical appliances, wires, plumbing, metal frames, or any other conducting path that has the lowest impedance. A large pulse of energy could also cause an arc or a side flash within an ungrounded system as it seeks a viable path back to the earth. An arc or side flash will help that pulse of energy reach a conductive material that does have a connection to the earth, like a plumbing pipe or a wire for instance. These side flashes could potentially pass through your body and or cause a fire if the energy were to pass through a combustible material. So a properly grounded system must provide a path for those high frequency DC pulses of energy to get back to the earth. If lightning were to strike this utility cable, for example, it could flow along the wires towards the ground rod of the transformer, as well as the ground rod of the service panel, as it safely returns to earth. Otherwise, the circuits could be blown, causing equipment damage and or fire. So while this earth grounding is not used to clear ground faults, it can effectively dissipate static electricity and external high voltages like lightning strikes to avoid overvolted situations and prevent system damage. And this is why system grounding is so important, with the grounding electroconductor not being any longer than necessary, nor should it have any unnecessary twists or bends to ensure that it can quickly and efficiently dissipate high frequency pulses of energy. Now, the additional auxiliary grounding electrode for array grounding that was required in code 690.47D in the 2014 edition of the National Electrical Code was relocated to code 690.47B starting in 2017 and is now permitted or allowed rather than required in accordance with Article 250.52 and 250.54. With that said, installing a supplemental or auxiliary ground rod at the array as opposed to grounding to the main service ground could give rise to a dangerous earth ground potential between the two earth connections. Separate earth connections at both the photovoltaic array and the service panel could increase the risk of equipment damage due to any difference in ground potential. A large current caused by nearby lightning or a power line fault could, for instance, flow through the low impedance grounding system, traveling through the earth, up the conductors, through the PV system, and back down the equipment grounding conductors and through the inverter as it returns to the earth. These large voltages induced by a high frequency pulse may pose a safety hazard and cause significant equipment damage. This difference in ground potential can be avoided by directly connecting the grounding for the array to the grounding at the main service panel, preferably as close to the grounding electrode as possible. 
Depending on system design and local requirements, a below-grade grounding conductor could even bond or connect a supplemental grounding electrode at the array to the grounding electrode at the main service panel, creating an equipotential zone. You see, a grounding system can have multiple ground electrodes, but they should all be bonded together, with everything below ground bonded together and everything above ground bonded together, and then bonding those two systems together with a grounding electrode conductor at only one point. Well, I hope this video has provided a basic understanding of why we ground PV systems, not only to meet system requirements for inspection purposes, but also to ensure a safe installation, minimizing the risk of electrical shock, fire hazard, or even external high voltages like lightning. And while we've only scratched the surface on this topic, in upcoming videos we'll consider additional aspects of photovoltaic grounding, including code compliance with the National Electrical Code, as well as some of the practical installation guidelines required. But as always, it's recommended that you consult with a licensed electrician, a solar professional, or your local authority having jurisdiction, AHJ, to ensure that all safety measures are practiced and all system requirements are met. You can subscribe to this channel to stay connected on upcoming episodes of the Solar Clips video series, but in the meantime, please visit our website for more information on solar photovoltaics and other energy-related topics.